Good morning, friends. Uh, blessed Sabbath. And I want to not only welcome those of you who are here worshiping with us, I, I think that um, uh, we estimated that when we sent out the email to our church family that we were going to kind of have a reduced service, that a lot of other churches that were closed found out and they've come here. <laughs> you are brave souls. <laughs> but uh, we're glad to see you here. We, we believe we have many more people that are joining us online. Matter of fact, if Santiago, I don't know if you're in the building nearby. There, yeah, come on up here. Santiago uh, is charge of the social media for Amazing Facts, and we're streaming right now, and sometimes you get uh, little messages. Where, where are people watching from right now? So right now, we have Six feet, hang on. Oh, that's right. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we got people watching from Romania. Romania, greet, oh. welcome. We want to welcome these people that are joining us. Germany, Germany, Ireland, Zimbabwe, uh, Zimbabwe Mexico, Ireland, Mexico, North Carolina, North Carolina, <laughs> Papua, New, uh, Papua New Guinea, yeah, um, West Wisconsin, Tennessee, Wisconsin, Tennessee Washington, Washington, Jamaica. We want to welcome you. Can you say Amen, friends? Yeah. Where else? Dubai, yeah, Dubai. Dubai, the United yeah. Arab Emirates. Praise the Lord. How many right now are tuning in? Uh, right now. It builds once the service starts, but we yeah. can get a feed. We have about 1,100 people watching total. Amen. So praise the Lord. That's on Facebook. And then many, because of the time change, they will tune in later and watch the archive of the program. Thanks so much, Santiago. We just wanted to let you folks know we know that you're there, and uh, we're, you're in our prayers. We know that some of you are isolated. You have no church to go to. And uh, especially during these difficult times, we thank God for this technology that allows us to minister to each other. And both Granite Bay and Amazing Facts are going to do all we can in the weeks, uh, maybe even months ahead, to continue sharing the gospel and try and uh, keep a, a spiritual biblical perspective on what we see unfolding. I finished a book yesterday. It takes me a long time to read some of these books on history. This was on Christopher Columbus. And um, it's a fascinating story. Not only was there some commentary I read the account from his sons, some of his fellow captains, his own logs, went through all of his logs. And uh, a very religious man. He actually felt that his mission was a fulfillment of prophecy. And I don't know if people today really realize what faith it took for him and how courageous it was for him to say, we're going to head west. They had never just continued sailing west because in those ancient maps that they had, they called it uncharted territory. You know, when the Roman soldiers had maps of the world that they were conquering, um, once they got to a part of Africa or a part of Asia where they didn't know what was there, they would put monsters and dragons on the map. And uh, they called it, I remember reading in history about a Roman soldier, a captain that sent a messenger back to Rome. They were in Northern Africa. And they kept going deeper into Africa. And he sent back a message. And it said, we've marched off the map. Give new orders. Well, friends, we are in uncharted territory now. We have marched off the map. Uh, what is happening in the world today is certainly unprecedented. And I know there's a broad spectrum of feelings out there. Some are, you know, the sky is falling. Uh, and then others are saying, peace, peace when there is no peace. And as Christians, we need to have uh, both a practical and a biblical perspective on what in the world is going on. Amen? Uh, most importantly, God doesn't want us to live in fear. Uh, Jesus has told us again and again, even though this is in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And uh, I sleep pretty well at night in spite of what's going on because I know how the story ends. Amen? And, but in the meantime... I believe that Christians have an unprecedented opportunity right now. Because when people are afraid, the Bible speaks in the last days of men's hearts failing for fear, looking after those things that are coming upon the earth. When people are afraid, we can show them where they find peace in the Prince of Peace. And so let's remember that uh, perhaps we've come to the kingdom for such an hour as this. Our message this morning, it says in your bulletin, signs of the times, but uh, I've added a little... A uh, preview for that. It's plagues, pestilence, and prophecy, signs of the times. 
And uh, I just want to remind our friends, Pastor Ross mentioned it earlier, if you'd like to be kept uh, update, those who are watching online, um, one thing I think we did not mention is some people said we don't have Facebook. Now we're streaming at the Granite Bay Amazing Facts Doug Bachelor Facebook page. If you don't have Facebook, Granite Bay, you can watch streaming just, I think it's through Vimo. So just go to the Granite Bay SDA page. I'm telling you, who may know people that don't have Facebook, you can text them now so that they can tune in and uh, they can still join us. If you want the updates on what's going to be happening online, because for the next few weeks, maybe months, we may be meeting and worshiping online. Uh, at this point, as pastors, we do not know what will happen next week. We don't even know what's going to be happening two hours from now. Things are, we're in a very fluid, dynamic situation. Amen? So we need to keep in touch. If you want to know how to do that, just text the word online to, five, to 40544. And we'll, as we learn about what's happening as far as streaming and video and worship and prayer meeting and Bible study, uh, you will keep you appraised of that and pass that on to your friends. Probably one of the most recognizable pieces of real estate in the world is a picture you've got on your screen. Oh, it's up there. It'll come. It's on its way. Wait for it. That's the Temple Mount. I think we all know that in Jerusalem. It's a holy place for Jews, Christians, Muslims, literally billions of people in the world look upon this spot on what would really be an arid desert region on a mountain as holy ground. This is where the temple of the Lord was at one time. And you know, when um, Solomon built that beautiful temple up there, following the reign of his father David, who had prepared all the stones, and after he dedicated the temple, he offered thousands of sacrifices. It says, then the Lord appeared to Solomon. Now this is in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. You may want to go there and there's a couple of words in here you might want to underline. 2 Chronicles 7, start with verse 12. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night. This is, remember, he appeared to him earlier and said, what do you want? He said, I want wisdom. Years later, the temple's built. He's dedicated the temple. He's built his own palace. God appears again. And he said, I've heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself. Now I've underlined that, chosen this place. You'll see why, trust me. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or, underline, send pestilence among my people. If my people, yeah, we're not immune to pestilence, are we? I think it's, we got to be careful like everyone else. I've heard some Christians say, oh, we just got to pray Psalm 91. Nothing will happen to us. I don't tempt the Lord. God says sometimes pestilence is even sent among his people. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Please don't miss that we need healing and sometimes pestilence comes because of wicked ways and the need for forgiveness. I think that... Um, it's very appropriate. I just heard last night someone texted me that uh, our president has designated, they've actually have a day of prayer, but they've moved it up to tomorrow because of this special need right now. And so tomorrow, you probably heard, they're asking that to be a special day of prayer. I think we can start praying right now. God's people need to humble themselves and pray. Now, you may not know the story behind why God picked that place. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles 21. 1 Chronicles 21. See what we just read was 2 Chronicles. Now I want you to go to the story. How did this place get picked? You know, when the Lord brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he had told them, when you get into the promised land, there'll be a place that I will choose to put my name. And he hadn't told them where it was. Hundreds of years went by. They didn't know where that place was. This is the story that helps them find the place for the house of God. First Chronicles 21 verse 1 and I'm going to read through verse 14. 
And you'll also find a parallel story for this in 2 Samuel chapter 24. I'll be reading most of it from 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, that's from north to south, and bring the number of them to me that I might know it. Now Joab, the general, he realized there's something really wrong with this. Um, the Bible said that it would be appropriate to from time to time take a census of the people. You can read about this in Exodus 30 verse 12. Don't lose your place there in 1 Chronicles. But I'll read to you Exodus 30 verse 12. When you take a census of the children of Israel for their number, then is there anything wrong with counting people? We know how many members we have. How do you know if one's missing? When the shepherd had 100 sheep and he said, wait a second, I just brought them back in the fold and we got 99. There is one missing. How did he know that? Good shepherd counts his sheep. Can you say amen? Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. When you take a census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man of you shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord when you number them, that there may be no plague among them when you number them. A couple of things I want you to spot right here. That connection, <laughs> Moses said that if you do the census wrongly, inappropriately, there could be a plague. And one reason for that is God did not want them to become proud of their numbers or trust in their numbers. And so he said uh, they were to do an offering. And the other thing is the priests were the ones who were responsible for taking the census because then there was a tax. It was a very small amount that was given to the priests and to the temple for the maintenance of the temple. You remember once they sent to Jesus through Peter and they said, does your master pay the temple tax? They're talking about this, this tax that they paid in connection with the census. It's interesting, Jesus was born during the time of a census too. So nothing wrong with that in particular, but why now is David doing it? Is he doing it for spiritual reasons? If you read in your Bibles there in 1 Chronicles, just before the numbering of Israel, it says, David conquered the Syrians, he conquered the Ammonites, Rabbah fell, they killed the remaining relatives of Goliath. Victory, victory, victory. Finally, peace all around. They'd conquered all of their enemies, and you know what had finally happened? For the first time in their history, they really possessed the borders that God had promised them. Now, did God tell Israel, after you have your borders that I've given to Abraham, that you're to go become a world empire and conquer everybody else? Something happened and David started thinking, you know, I haven't lost a battle yet. And uh, I wonder how many soldiers I've got now in case I want to expand off into Egypt or go up into Asia or down into India. Maybe he was getting a little bit of that, you know, Napoleon Alexander the Great mentality that I'm going to conquer the world. Let me read you a quote from the book Prophets and Kings, page 747 with a view of extending his conquests among the foreign nations, David determined to increase his army by requiring military service from all who were of proper age. To effect this, it became necessary to take a census of the population. It was pride and ambition that prompted this action. And David had started thinking like other kings. So he sends them out. I want to go back here to our passage in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 21. He sends them out. Joab right away knows this is unbiblical. Listen to the protest of his general. May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are, but my Lord, the king, are they not my Lord's servants? Why then does the Lord require this thing? Why should it be a cause of guilt in Israel? Even Joab, as rough as he was, he said, this is not God's will. What do you, we, we finally conquered our land that was given to us. Why are you thinking about going beyond? Our soldiers are finally able to go home and rest. Why are you wanting to recruit more soldiers? But David said, look, Joab, you've given me a hard enough time. This is, I'm the king. I know you're my cousin or my nephew, but I want you to do it. They must have had quite a discussion. It says, nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore, Joab departed, and he went through all of Israel. And he came to Jerusalem, and Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. Now, you don't read here, but you do read in Samuel. It took nine months to do this. It actually took 290 days it took Joab 
to do the census all around the land of Israel. And he comes back, and it says that Joab is so disgusted he didn't even number them all. And he brings the number, he brings the tally to David. All Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. It doesn't tell you about you know, the women and the children and those who were too old for the army. But he did not even count Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. He spent those 290 days doing something he loathed. He said, this is not right. This is not God's will. And during this time, David became convicted. Thought, yeah, it was pride. What am I thinking? And not only was David convicted, uh, the people had become very proud. They'd conquered all their enemies. They'd taken their wealth. They'd taken their territory. National pride got to be where they were putting the trust in themselves and their army and their abilities instead of entrusting the Lord. And it says, God was displeased with this thing. I'm in verse 7. He struck Israel. Now, how did he strike them? So David said to God, I've sinned greatly because I've done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer. Gad was a prophet, saying, go tell David, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. Any of you ever have a parent that when you cut up, they say you're going to be punished. I'm going to give you two or three choices. You know, I have some parents, they tell their kids, can't see your friends for three days, one week without the computer, or I'm going to spank you until you pass out. And the kid will say, spank me. I can't live without the computer. I can't live without my friends. So God says to David, choose something. He said, uh, I'm going to offer these things. So David comes to David, uh, Gad comes to David, I'm in verse 11, and says to him, thus says the Lord, choose for yourself either three years of famine, people die in famine, or three months to be defeated before your foes. Soldiers die in war, or the sword of your enemies overtaking you or else three days the sword of the Lord. Now what is the sword of the Lord? It tells you here, the sword of the Lord, the plague, disease. Uh, they didn't have microscopes back then, but they had plagues, and they knew that these inexplicable diseases would sometimes go through, and people would drop, and, and they didn't always understand why, and they called it the sword of the Lord. We'll go through the land. Now consider what, sh what I should do to take back word. Gad says to David, tell me what your choice is. And David said, I am in great distress. He realizes that he's not just going to suffer for this, but the people are going to suffer. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. He said, you know, if you want to send the famine, or if you want to send the plague, but don't, don't send war. I don't want to fall into the hand of man. I'm going to trust you, Lord, for your mercies. So the Lord, he wanted to get it over quickly. You know, God doesn't want us to live in agony when we're suffering. Yeah, he doesn't want to draw it out. He's a loving father. I know sometimes <laughs> when my kids are in trouble and they needed chastisement, if they, I'd be in some public place or a store and they'd cut up and I'd warn them once or twice and then I'd say, all right, when we get home, we're going to deal with this. Boy, 10 times more suffering just going home, thinking about it, waiting for the moment. And I was usually pretty merciful when that finally came because I knew they'd suffer just in anticipation. So God wanted to get it over with. He said, look, we're going to do three days of plague in the land. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 men of Israel died. Well, that brings us to our subject for the day. Why did this happen? You know, all of the sin in the world, all the suffering in the world is a result of sin. And I suggest that the prayer that God gave to Solomon, if my people will humble themselves turn from their wicked ways, I'll forgive their sin. It's telling us that we got problems with pride, with wickedness, with sin. Um, 
Judgments almost always biblically come, and I know I'm going to get some emails. Some people are going to say, oh, Pastor Doug, these are just things that have... Well, the way I read the Bible is that uh, these things, you know, sometimes the righteous do suffer along with the wicked, but the reason there is suffering in our world today is because of sin. The whole creation groans and travails today because of sin and because the love of many grow cold. And the greatest sin is pride. That's where the devil fell. Listen to this book, Christ Object Lessons, page 154. The evil that led to Peter's fall, that shut the Pharisee from communion with God, is proving the ruin of thousands today. There's nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins, it is the most hopeless, the most incurable. And, uh, and I think God is trying to get the attention of the world. You know how he does that? By humbling us. It's a little easier for us to humble ourselves with God's help, huh? Jeremiah 17, verse 5 says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Now, you know what it tells us about David's military? We just read it. He had a military of 1,570,000. Do you know what the U.S. standing military is? 1,347,000. David's military, well, of course, we got some weapons David didn't have back then. So he didn't need quite as many boots on the ground today as they did back then. But uh, isn't that mind-boggling that his army was bigger than the United States Army? And he was pretty proud of that. And he thought, you know, I bet we could take on some other countries. I'd like to extend my, in the name of the Lord, we'll do it. And it was really in his name. He, it was starting to go to his head. And it wasn't just him. Plague fell on the people because there was, there was pride there too. They were becoming very comfortable with themselves and their world and earthly possessions, and that happens to the church as well. Sometimes God sends his judgments to humble us. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Daniel 3, 4, 37 those who walk, and by the way, you know who said this? King Nebuchadnezzar when he was humbled. Those who walk in pride, he's able to put down. King Josiah, on the other hand, when he heard the word of God, he humbled himself. God sent a message to him. This is 2 Chronicles 34, verse 27. Josiah, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against its inhabitants, and you humbled yourself before me, and you tore your clothes, and you wept before me, I have also heard you, says the Lord. You know, I'm always, phenom I, I, I'm just amazed. I find it phenomenal in the Bible as I read about these kings that were often so proud. And when they humbled themselves, God prolonged their prosperity. He prolonged their mercy. When Nebuchadnezzar had that tree, that dream of the tree that is cut down, Daniel later says to him, Humble yourself, and it may be a lengthening of your tranquility. When wicked King Ahab, he kills Naboth so that he can take his vineyard, murders him. Elijah the prophet comes, and he says, a judgment's going to come on your house, and your kingdom's going to be cut off because of your sin. After he got the word of God, even that wicked king, he put on sackcloth, he mourned, and God says to Elijah, you know, God and Elijah talk like friends. God says to Elijah, have you beheld Ahab? how he's humbling himself. Because he's humbling himself, I'm not going to bring that disaster on his house in his days. So if you want to, biblically, if you want to prolong your prosperity and tranquility, we as a church, as a city, a nation, the world, we better humble ourselves before our maker. Um, sin in the world and secularism is just sweeping like a tsunami around the planet. And people, God is very patient. He's long-suffering, but there's a, you'd be surprised, maybe you're not so surprised, how quickly things can change. The sword of the Lord went through the land. So you read 1 Chronicles 21, 16, David lifted his eyes. And I guess evidently this angel of death, you know, you read in Egypt about the plagues. The last plague was what? Pestilence, angel of death, went through the land with its sword. 
And one time Hezekiah, when they were being attacked by the Assyrians, he prayed that God would deliver them, and a pestilence went through the Assyrian camp, and in one day, 185,000 died. One day. You know, more than once in history, people of God have been saved because a pestilence went through their enemy camp. And David lifted his eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, having his hand drawn with his sword stretched out over Jerusalem. Now, we just read that 70,000 had died in Israel, and maybe the plague started at the coasts and by the sea and was working its way uphill. And finally, you know, some of the highest land is Jerusalem. And David's been getting word, has been coming to the king through messengers that the Thousands have fallen here and thousands have fallen here and now it's spread to Galilee and it's down in the south and it's up by Dan and it's in Beersheba and he's getting this word and, and all the elders are putting on sackcloth their morning. They're seeing this thing spread. Over three days it's spread and they knew it was coming towards them. And so David and the elders, it says, they put on sackcloth and they're praying. And while they're praying, he, David, you know, he's got the Holy Spirit. He sees his angel of judgment with a sword in its hand going through the land as a symbol of that plague that has taken all the lives between heaven and earth. And it says, the elders were clothed in sackcloth. They fell on their faces along with David. So you, you see where we are today? Are you aware how serious this is, what's happening? Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm not even talking about the medical component. It is unprecedented you would have international cancellation of public gatherings and travel and business trips and conventions. Uh, there is definitely going to be some economic fallout. There already is from this. I mean, you hear the president say national emergency. You hear the health leaders say, we have a global pandemic. You know, we've often used the word pandemic, like the news often says, you know, whenever there's a bad storm, a storm of biblical proportions. They think, what's the most powerful word? Biblical. Or they'll say, there, there's an apocalyptic locust going through Africa. They look for the biblical language because they can't think of anything more powerful than that. Well, usually we use the word pandemic. We're exaggerating. Isn't that right? We're not exaggerating now. That's what it is. Potential global economic disaster. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just, let's, let's be real for a second here. Thousands of major events have been canceled. Thousands of schools, colleges, universities have closed. We heard that Nathan wasn't just coming home for vacation, but he was coming home to stay. <laughs> and there's sighing and crying in my house. No, we're, well, not, not mom, but, you know, I thought he's out of the nest. Thousands of companies have suspended all business travel. The global supply chain has been impacted, including medications. And you know it's apocalyptic in California when they close Disneyland. <laughs> Certain items have been cleared from the shelves. And people are fighting over toilet paper. So I've got, I've got a little stock tip for you. If you're wondering how to invest during these times, find out who makes the toilet paper. <laughs> I just heard in the news, you've probably seen some of these things going around, that people were pulling out knives. I went, Karen, I was at Walmart yesterday. Karen said that she had to circle Costco three times before she could get in the parking place. It's something like that, right? Yeah. And, we, and I said, do you need anything? She said, well, there's no paper towels here. And so I got to Walmart, and I was just picking up hummingbird food. I mean, everyone else is stockpiling stuff, and I'm thinking, yeah. Anyway, I'll be coming to your house. You realize you're supposed to pay a tithe? A <laughs> tithe of your TP? A tithe. <laughs> you all take care of your pastors now, won't you, during this time? Yeah, we're going to take a census. No, <laughs> I could do that. You got to laugh. I tell you, friends, it is serious. But uh, yeah, I went to Walmart yesterday and uh, she said, pick up some paper towels. We're okay in the other department. And uh, boy, I, I got there and they were pop putting it on a pallet and people were ripping the boxes open. They weren't letting the store clerks rip the box open. They were ripping open the boxes and pulling it out. 
And I got mine. I only had to, you know, wrestle with three grandmas in order to get it. But not really. But I did get my paper towels. But it is serious. I, we're laughing, but really, have you ever seen anything like this before? I wonder if God's trying to get our attention. There are economic consequences. There were back in David's day. First Chronicles 21. Then King David. Oh, I, I want to read to you what leads up to this point. It, the hero of the story is coming into picture for me. So you read about David sees the angel between heaven and earth in Jerusalem. And um, he's got the sword drawn. Um, in verse 16 of uh, 1 Chronicles, back to 1 Chronicles 21. And um, evidently Jerusalem is next, but you know how David loves Jerusalem. When Absalom rebelled, David said, I'm going to leave Jerusalem so war doesn't take the city. They called it the city of who? City of David. Of course, he'd born in Bethlehem. It was a suburb. It's his city. Now, David has Jerusalem because they'd conquered the Jebusites, but they did not wipe out the Jebusites. And so David sees the angel of the Lord with the sword stretched over Jerusalem. And David said to God, uh, and David said to God, was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil. But these sheep, still thinking like a shepherd, these sheep, what have they done? The people that were going to perish from the plague. Let your hand, I pray, O Lord my God, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people that they should be plagued. And maybe when he said my father's house, some of his brothers were also generals in the army. They may have said, yes, Dan, David, let's go conquer other lands. So he and his father's house were taking response. He's offering himself. Notice, they, David, Jesus is the son of David. He's offering himself as a substitute for the people. Oh Lord, what have they done? Let it be against me. He's offering his life. It's kind of like when Moses is on the mountain and he's praying for Israel. So don't wipe them out. Just take my name out of your book. It's like Paul said, I am willing to perish that Israel might be saved. That's the spirit of real Christianity. It's a spirit of self-sacrifice. What have they done? Let your hand be against me. Verse 18. Therefore the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that he should go and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So David went at the word of, the Lord, of Gad, which had been spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan. Now Ornan is a man, a dignified man. He owns a large piece of property from when Jebus was conquered by David. It's within the confines of Jerusalem. It's on a high prominent hill. You notice David didn't just take everybody's property. And so here this prominent citizen who was a Jebusite. You know, a lot of the faithful people in Israel were not Israelites. One of David's most faithful soldiers was called Uriah the Hittite. And you read about him and he loved the Lord. Uh, he talked about the people of God, the Lord, the name of the Lord. I mean, some of these people converted. You got the Shunammite woman up in the north. Made a place for the prophet of God. Some of these were converts that were very dedicated. And evidently Ornan, and you'll see in, in um, Second Samuel, he's called Arana. It's the same person, the same, same name. David comes to him, and he says that he's to erect a threshing floor, uh, uh, an altar to the Lord on his threshing floor. Threshing floor was a big flat spot when they were threshing wheat. They would beat the wheat, and they'd throw it in the air with these wooden shovels, and the breeze would blow the chaff away, and the clean wheat would be in a pile. They'd beat some more, and they'd separate it. And so they were separating the wheat from the chaff which, by the way, biblically is a sign of judgment. So this ha is happening in the context of a judgment. Separating the wheat from the chaff. Does that sound like a parable to you? And it says, so David went at the word of God. Now Ornan turned and he saw the angel. This is my favorite verse in the whole story, friends. Ornan turned and he saw the angel. Where is the angel? Between heaven and earth. What's he holding? Sword. And the sword is still out. What would you do? His four sons who were with him hid themselves, as most of us would. But Ornan continued threshing wheat. Wow. When everybody else is hiding themselves, he continued threshing wheat. What does bread represent in the Bible? The Word of God. Is this a time for us to hide our light under a bush? 
Times of darkness is when light is the most important. Ornan continued threshing wheat. I mean, he was so at peace with God, he thought, well, here I am. I can't outrun an angel. I'm not going to stand here. I got to thresh this wheat. He continues doing what is least faithfully. I remember reading a story years ago about this uh, young monk in a monastery somewhere in Europe, and he got a hold of a Bible. And he read in the Bible about Jesus coming. He got to the end of the Bible and said, the Lord is coming, even so come Lord Jesus. And he was so exercised and excited about Jesus coming, he went out to talk to the leader of the monastery who was out in the local garden hoeing his peas. And he says, I've read in the Bible that Jesus is coming again. He said, yes, my son, he's hoeing his weeds out of the peas. And he was a little bothered that the head brother wasn't more excited about it. He said, the Bible says Jesus is coming soon. He said, yes, yes he is. And he said, well, if Jesus was going to come tonight, what would you do? He said, well, I'd finish hoeing these peas. God wants us to be faithful in doing the right things, even the little things, and continue uh, threshing wheat. No matter what's happening in the world today, we need to continue doing what God has called us to do. Now, I, I put here in my notes, you might uh, be interested, Ornan, the Jebusite, his name actually means Jehovah is firm. And again, that's the same person as Orana. And uh, he continued threshing wheat. You know, God comes to people and he uses people that are busy. What was Gideon doing when God called him? Threshing wheat. What was Elisha doing when God called him? Plowing the field. What were Peter, James, John, Andrew doing when Jesus called them? Cleaning their nets one time and says fishing. God wants us to be faithfully busy in his work. We don't know the day and the hour of his coming, but he wants us to stay busy with what he's doing, or what God's work is. Amen? So he says, look, I, I want to build an altar here on your property, and uh, let me buy it from you. And Ornan deals like a prince with David. He said, take it to yourself, verse 23. Take it to yourself. Let my lord the king do what is good in his eyes. Look, I'll also give you the oxen for burnt offerings, the threshing implements for wood, and the wheat and the grain offering, I give it all. Now here is a man that is generous, he's sacrificial, he knows a plague is going through the land, he sees an angel with a drawn sword, and he just seems so steady through the whole thing. He seems so magnanimous and generous. And David said to Ornan, verse 24, No, I will surely buy it for the full price. I will not take what is yours for the Lord. Nor, and here's a principle you might underline for the rest of the Bible, I will not offer a burnt offering of that which costs me nothing. Is it a sacrifice? If I pick your pocket on the way out of church and put it in the offering plate, is that a sacrifice for me? No. The government does that all the time, right? They take our money and give it away. And then they talk about how good they are. They're, not, they're taking our money. <laughs> no, so it's like King Saul when he killed the Amalekites and he was supposed to wipe out all the people and all the cattle and everything and he comes back and they got the best of the sheep and the cattle and, and Samuel said, you haven't done the word of God. He says, oh no, we've, I've done it. I wiped out all the people, but we kept the best of the sheep and the goats and to offer to the Lord. That's so he wouldn't have to offer his. So he's offering someone else's after he takes it from them. And you know what happened? Samuel said, that God has more delight in obedience than sacrifice. David said, if this sacrifice doesn't cost me anything, it's not a sacrifice. So David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold. That's about $450,000 in our money today in gold. Two shekels to the ounce, approximately. I'll let you do the math. $1,500 for an ounce of gold. He gives 600 shekels of gold by weight. You notice that David pays the price. David is interceding. And David there builds an altar to the Lord, and he offers a burnt offering and a peace offering. And notice what happened. David calls on the Lord. He's interceding for the people. He's praying for his sheep. And God, capital H-E, God answers him from heaven by fire on the altar, a burnt offering. Now, you know what happened on that place? This is the place where God said to Abraham, bring your son to the mountains of Moriah. 
and Abraham brought Isaac up to that hill. This is the place where a king named Melchizedek lived, and Abraham brought him tithes. This is the place where David had the experience and fire comes down from heaven. Later, Solomon builds the temple. You know what else happened? Fire comes down from God out of heaven. So how many times does fire come down from God out of heaven? Not very often. But here David prays and it says, fire came from God down on that place. The children of Israel were wondering, how much longer are we going to carry this portable temple around? Well, God says, I'll tell you when and where the place is. And finally, this is the time where God tells them, this is the place, buy it. And it says, at that time when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. And you go to chapter 22, verse 1. It says, and David said, this is the house of God. This is the altar of burnt offering. Because up until that time, the old portable tabernacle was it was in tatters from that. And you know what? The plague was stopped because of the intercession of David during that time. Now I want you to notice something, friends. Um, David is really a type of Christ in this story. Um, he intercedes for the people. He prays for them. He pays for it. He substitutes. He mediates. He's a type of Christ here. Now, you know, plagues are pretty frightening things, and pestilence, you know, it's always kind of spooky when something going around you can't see. I've just noticed here in church now, we're all kind of eyeing each other suspiciously. You, you can kind of clear your throat, and people go, I got one eye, it's a little red, it's hay fever. I'm thinking, oh man, what are they going to think about me? It's windy yesterday, but they're going to think I got the plague. You can't see can't see each other and, and, uh, or you can't see the disease and it's something frightening but I'm actually encouraged because the way I read my Bible sometimes great plagues precede great deliverance. It was after this pestilence the place was chosen for the temple and it was a place for intercession with God. Let me read a verse to you that you know. Exodus 12, 29 And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants, and all of Egypt, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. It was following this last plague the Israelites begin their journey to the promised land. You know, it was following that plague that the Egyptians finally paid the Israelites for their years of service. It was following that plague that they were finally set free. And all the Egyptians didn't die. God did not send the plague to uh, see if he could wipe out the Egyptians. He wanted to save them. Indeed, some of them came out of Egypt with the children of Israel. And so this plague, and just the only time is going to tell what's going to happen, you know, we were not too clear what was going on there in China because there was kind of government-controlled reports that were coming up. But when it hit Italy, and they started showing pictures of hospitals that were overwhelmed within a few days, that's when you saw some very radical reactions that were happening in the governments of the world, including our own. Uh, right now, from what I can tell, the government officials are saying that this is something that's probably going to 70% of the population is going to be exposed to it. Most will be okay. But it has a much more virulent, much more deadly impact than the common flu. And um, so we need to be praying. You know, what a great opportunity um, for us as Christians. There's several ways that I see that uh, this can be an opportunity for Christ and the gospel. First of all, we ought to humble ourselves and pray. Um, I think, of course, we should follow common sense health practices. We should pray that God will help us be more courageous for the gospel. If we've got neighbors, they're afraid. Don't be afraid to ask, can I pray for you? Can I pray with you? You'd be surprised how many people will say, yes, please. Give them a piece of literature. What a good time to give out the health magazine. I did a program last week with uh, Dr. Nedley talking about 
uh, one of the best preventions for coronavirus, since there is no vaccine at this point, is follow the health message, increase your immunity. And we know that. We know what the Bible says about clean and unclean food and natural remedies and sunshine and fresh air and exercise and, and rest and all those things. And so many people are sick and they're, they're increasing their liability. We have answers that can help. It's not the whole answer, but it, it can help. We should be sharing these things. And most of all, don't be afraid. Jesus doesn't want us to be afraid. Now, there is a, there is a plague in the land. There's a plague in the world. It's a pandemic. It's not coronavirus. It's called sin. Coronavirus are saying somewhere between two and three, maybe four per hundred percent uh, will die from this. That's terrible. Do you know there's a hundred percent death rate from sin? And uh, the plague has gone around the world. And it also requires quarantine. Do you know why we can't see God? We're separated. Your sins have separated you from God, Isaiah tells us. Sin will separate you from God. It separates us. It isolates us from each other. Sin will separate you from you. You won't even like you because of your sins. Well, one of the most traumatic things I ever went through in my life, my parents used to send my brother and I to summer camp. <laughs> we got sent away a lot. I don't know why. But they, every summer they sent us to summer camp. And, I, you know, I used to enjoy it. We went to these camps up in Songo Camp, Songo Camp Mendoza up in Maine. And uh, I remember the bus picked us up. Our moms all would gather at this spot. This bus would pick us up and take us up to Maine. And, and after I, we got on the bus and I drove a few minutes, I was scratching. And a uh, counselor said, you get bit by mosquitoes already? I said, I don't know what it is. I got these little bumps. He looked at me and said, you got chicken pox. Here I'm on a busload of kids on the way to summer camp. Well, they said, we can't turn the bus around. They got me to camp. They put me in their little infirmary. I was quarantined. I'll tell you, I've never gotten over that. <laughs> I'm in this room. And, you know, I did have my guinea pig. I smuggled my guinea pig up to camp with me. They let me keep my guinea pig because they felt sorry for me. I'm in this room with my guinea pig, and I'm wondering how in the world I got chicken pox in New York City. I never saw any chickens in New York City. <laughs> and I, outside the window, I see all of my friends are screaming and playing and having a good time, and I'm just dying in here. Plus, I'm scratching everywhere. It was awful. Sin separates. And uh, what sin does to us is a lot more serious than chicken pox. You know, they found out that there's only one antidote for sin. There is a vaccine. I was reading, uh, you know, Dr. Um, DeRose, remember here, wrote a book on how to survive Ebola. And since 2015, they found that the very best defense against Ebola is if you were to get blood from the person who was exposed but did not succumb. They have developed antibodies to the virus that would help you survive. The only person who has come into our world and lived a sinless life is Jesus. And the only way for us to survive is because he died on the cross and he shed his blood is to believe in that blood, to accept Christ. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you know what he's talking about spiritually. You have no life in you. And we must this is a time of ever and never before to uh, claim the blood of Christ, to make sure our sins are forgiven, and after you come to Christ, be witnesses to go for him. Is that your desire? You know, I thought it'd be appropriate as we close our service. We'll have our closing song in just a moment, but before we do, why don't we kneel together? It says, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Is there ever time that we need that more than now?